Hey there, and welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hurts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor Josh, and I am so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, paper, your phone, however you want to take notes, and get ready for today's message. Let's jump right in. Today we are going to be concluding our series on the armor of God. Can anybody guess what piece of armor we're talking about today? No. Sneakers. Yes, sir. We're talking about shoes again. No, we are going to be talking about the sword of the Spirit, and uh, the, the sword that we're going to talk about today is not exactly like this, but it's very, very similar. We're going to get to that in just a little bit, but I want to say this to you. Spiritual battles are a lot like natural battles. Nations don't constantly engage in warfare, although it seems lately like we are constantly in some kind of fight. Um, Normally, it's hit or miss here and there every few years. That's kind of like how it is in our life. Like, we're not in a battle every single day. And if you are in a battle every single day, we've got to find out who your enemy is. You might just be beating yourself up. Now, I'm just saying, the enemy is not going to come and attack you every single day. But there are strategies of war. There are ways to be ready for battle when a fight comes or when a spiritual battle arises. And that's why Paul tells us that we need to be prepared and maintain our position when that fight comes. And Ephesians 6, 17, let's look at this today. It says, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God. Cheat sheet right there. Which is the Word of God. All right, so let's talk about this a little bit today. Uh, the Romans had five different types of swords. Um, if you are into that sort of thing, if you're a gun buff or if you're a sword person, if you're a hunter, you probably have more than one way to hunt. You probably have more than one knife, more than one sword, more than one gun. Uh, that's kind of how they were. They had different types of swords for different types of battle and throughout the generations of how they would fight. The first sword that the Roman soldiers had was called the gladius, the gladius sword. It was extremely heavy. It was a broad soul, uh, shouldered sword. It had a very long blade. Uh, it, it, would, it was so heavy and so cumbersome, it was known as a two-handed sword. Maybe something out of like Conan the Barbarian. Remember the Conan sh movies? We had that big, heavy sword, something like that. Um, it was blunt and dull on one side and sharp on the other. It would many times be so heavy that as the, the soldier would swing it, it would take him a little bit to catch his balance to, to kind of bring it back the other way, and he would have to, you know, kind of turn as he fought. It was only sharpened on one side, and after the Romans had lost a really bad battle using these kind of swords, they kind of like put them away. They would carry them in parades and that sort of thing, but they adopted a new type of sword after that. The second sword was shorter and narrower, approximately 17 inches long. The blade was about an inch and a half thick, two, an inch and a half to two inches thick, and, and therefore it was a lot lighter. They could, they could move it a lot faster. It grew in popularity throughout the empire because it was easier to carry and easier to swing. Remember, where would the soldiers have their sword when they were not using it? On their belt, right? So a really big, big, big sword on the belt would be kind of cumbersome. And, and, and it was normally, if you were a right-handed soldier, it would be on your left-hand side so that when you drew it, you, you would kind of draw it crossbody. So the smaller sword became something that they were more uh, apt to use. The third sword was even shorter than the second sword, and it was more like a dagger, and they could hide it differently within their armor, and, and it, was, it was made to just do that kill shot where they would come up underneath the armor and try to get into the heart. Um, it, it, just, it, wasn't, it wasn't really great for big battle. The fourth sword was slender and long, 
it was used for the cavalry, the guys on the horses. It would be kind of close to something like a fencing sword that we would see today. And that kind of sword wasn't really made for battle. You would never go into battle with a fencing sword. If you've ever seen somebody fence, they're very bendy and brittle, and it, it, just, it doesn't give the great kill shot. No soldier would have ever gone into battle with that. It was not effective. But the fifth sword, that's the sword. I know, a lot of information just to get to this point. The fifth sword is the kind of sword that... Paul was referring to in Ephesians 6, 17, when he said, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The word for the sword in the Greek is this word right here, and I have a recording of how to say it, because it's very strange how to say it. Ready? Listen to this. Machera. 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 And if you don't do that, <laughs> then you didn't say it right. Machera, right? It's actually kind of where we get the word machete from, right? Machete, it looks like, but it's machera. It was a brutal weapon. It looked just like the, the actual blade of this sword, between 19 and 24 inches long. It was razor sharp on both sides. This is, this is literally like a sharp sword, so I'm going to be careful as I'm playing with this today, right? razor sharp on both sides, and had a pointy, pointy, pointy spear tip on the end of it. I mean, this sword is sharp. If I, it will stick. I mean, it's, it's a sharp sword. <laughs> Made a hole in the stage. The crazy thing about this sword, and I'm, try, I'm not going to be too graphic, but I have to be a little bit graphic for us to understand this thing, okay? This sword was sharpened on both sides because when the Roman soldier went for center mass, and that's where they would go for, right? They would go for the stomach or the chest area. They wouldn't just go in with the sword. It wasn't just like an in and an out. It was an in and a turn. Whoo! <laughs> Oh, turn it. And as they would turn it, these razor edges would cut on both sides. And then when they pulled it out, insides would come out with it. Insides would come out with it. And, I'm, and again, I'm, I'm not trying to be too graphic, but I'm just wondering today, who needs to take the sword of the Spirit and stab it into some of their problems? Who needs to take the sword of the Spirit and stab it into their situation? And turn that thing up and pull the answer out. Pull their freedom out. Pull their deliverance out. I know it can sound graphic, but I'm tired of Christians being wimpy spiritually. We think because Jesus told us to turn the other cheek that we're supposed to be wussies. Turn the other cheek was in reference to our relationships with one another. Right? Right? I had this vision that I was going to take this sword because I love this sword and it's fun. And I was going to take apples and I was going to, you know, chop them in the air and show you how sharp it was. And I thought, wonder if it slips out of my hand and flies into the audience. That could be a whole situation. Right? Because we are not each other's problem. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities and power. See, so turn the other cheek was to flesh and blood. I don't got to turn the cheek to the devil. I don't got to do that. I don't got to let him smack me up. But you know what the problem is? You know what the problem is? The reason why we don't engage the devil, we don't know how to fight. We don't know how to fight. Can I tell you a story? I've been in a lot of, anybody been in a fight before? I'm going to a straight fist fight. Not just like we argued. All right. Like skin to skin. Yeah, anybody? Nobody? Okay, a few of you. All right. I've been in a lot of fights. My nose has more curves than the Indy 500 because my nose has been broken a couple times. All right? Been a lot of fights. But there's this one fight. Listen, I've never gone into a fight thinking I wasn't going to win. I always knew I was going to win the fight, even if I was waking up after the fight. 
I did not win every fight I was in, but I believed I was going to win every fight even if they were bigger than me, right? Because I'm going I'm to fight dirty. Anyway. So anyway, I knew I was going to get into this fight with this one guy, and as I like, you know, you step up, you square up, I know that I'm going to fight him. He goes into a pose like this. <laughs> now listen, you know when someone pulls something like that, you're outclassed. You were outclassed. Like he had the whole thing, like his fingers were double jointed. He knew like, ah, And I'm just kind of like, <laughs> he's like, I'm a black belt in Taekwondo. Ah, I was like, you ain't nothing. <laughs> so seriously, I'm like this. I'm right-handed, so I got this ready to go. This is the power punch, right? You're right-handed. You know you got the power hit right here. This is a jab, jab, bow. So I'm in position. I'm like, yeah. So I'm like this. He's like, ah. All of a sudden, he's like, soup. I never saw it coming. <laughs> it wasn't even that he got me on the blind side. It was just fast. He's like, swap. I didn't realize that I was in combat with a trained killer. <laughs> dude, dude hit me right here in the elbow with that kick. You know, like his foot went like this around his whole body. Soof. Hit me right here. Broke my elbow. Broke my arm. Soof. Broke my arm. Broke my elbow right there. <laughs> broke my jaw, hit me right in the funny bone, you know, hurt so bad, and I went home. I wasn't ready for that fight. He was a black belt in Taekwondo. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what I was messing with. I was like, ah, you know, and that's how a lot of us are, man. A lot of us think that we're going to step into some spiritual battle, and the devil's all like, ah. And we're like, well, Pastor Mike said, this is how I fight my battles. This is how. We, we stepping into a ring, but we ain't got no tools to fight with. The, the, the Word of God says that, that we have a two-edged sword, but we don't know how to use this thing. Seriously, yo, like, I was going to get up here, like, this is legit sharp, right? I was going to get up here, like, ah, wield this thing and get all, like, you know, like, I knew what I, I'm going to cut something off. I don't know how to use this thing. I'm not learned in the art of this thing, right? And that's how a lot of us are spiritually. We're like, I got the sword of the spirit, the word of God. There's a two-edged two sword and a lamp to my feet and a lamp to my power. Because we don't know. Although it's ours. It's been given to us. Paul says that salvation, you get this thing. You get this weapon. But most of us. I'm going to leave that right there. I mean, do you realize what that is? No, no. Do you realize who you are? Do you realize who you are? All right. This, this sword is so powerful. It's so sharp that Paul is telling us that when you use the word of God in its proper form, it becomes that uh, uh, uh kind of thing. It's devastating to the enemy. But we got to look at this. It says, and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, which is the Word of God. Now, this is what makes this thing different. We already talked about the belt of truth. The belt of truth is the Word of God. It's right in the midsection. The belt of truth is the logos. The written word of God. In this passage, taking the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, the word word there is the word rhema. Rhema. Taking the rhema word of God. Now, this one's a little bit different. This isn't just the written word. 
This describes something that is spoken clearly, spoken vividly, spoken in an undeniable language, spoken in an unmistakable, unquestionable, certain, and definite terms. Have you ever read the word, read your Bible, and it was like, boom, it jumped out off the page at you? Like, you saw something for the first time, it meant something different to you, or you just knew that you knew that you knew God had spoken to you. If you don't have that, don't step into battle. Because if you don't have a word from God, you're not going into battle with a sword. You're going into battle with a belt. There's a lot of Christians think they're in a spiritual battle, but they just, they're just sitting like this. Because the sword of the Spirit and the belt of truth are inseparable. Even when I'm in activation mode, even when I am using this, it's still housed here. The belt of truth is the written word of God, it's the Bible. But my sword must house on it. I'm going to tell you, what, a, what is a rhema word? A rhema word is when God speaks to you something that you have a promise, when there's a quickening of the word of God and you know that you know that you know God spoke to you. There's a lot of people who are in situations of life and I'll say to them, what scripture are you standing on? What scripture are you using in this season? What, what do you mean? What do you mean? I'm, I'm, nothing. Nothing. Well, that's why you're losing. Because you're in a fight without a sword. You're out there without a sword. Well, well, what do you mean, Pastor Mike? Like, how do I get a word from God? Ah, now we're asking the right questions. How do I get a word from God? Well, first, we got to get in the word. First, we got to get in. I mean, the average Christian has three Bibles. They read zero of them. Historically, general, general it's a generalization. We may go read the Bible on occasion or when in need. I mean, we, most of us in here, if we have a smartphone, probably have a Bible app. We have a Bible app that even has a magnifying glass on it. The magnifying glass means search. And you can write any word you want that you need to search, and it will pull up 10 Bible verses that has that word in it, just like Google. And you could find a verse about your situation that you can stand on. Now, let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. Quoting a Bible verse that Pastor Mike said, quoting a Bible verse that Pastor John Mark said, never makes it a sword. It might be a sword for Pastor John Mark because he has a revelation of that verse. But if that verse isn't a revelation to you, it's not revealed to you. There's not a promise in you. It's not a sword. And I'm just going to say, that's why a lot of what we say Christianity doesn't work is because we don't take the time to get a revelation. Let's just ask this. No judgment. Let's just, let's just be for real, right? I'm very, very self-aware. When would God give you a revelation? While you're watching TV? While you're Netflixing? While you're driving? Like, like what, what time in your life and in your day do you have it where God could possibly give you a revelation or a rhema of his word? If you're not taking the time to be in the word, I, I don't know when that's going to happen. Now, are there cases and situations where people have heard the audible voice of God? Yes. Has it ever happened in my life? No. No, I, can't, I couldn't tell you that I audibly ever heard the voice of God outside of my body. And isn't, I'm pretty into this stuff. Right, like I do this for a living. I, I don't know that, that, that there's been a situation in which I couldn't just have an urge or a knowing from God where I had to have an audible voice. And, and really, it doesn't really take a whole lot of faith to get an audible voice because then like, you just knew? Come on, let's say that for a second. A quickening word. 
A rhema word is when the Holy Spirit supernaturally quickens the, a, a scripture in a believer's heart and in their mind that they knew they heard from God. All right, I'm going to go, and I didn't talk about this at all first service, but I'm going to go there because i got a few minutes extra. That's my problem with personal prophecies. It's my little hesitation with people who think that they're prophets going around telling other people what God said, is that we automatically believe that that person heard from God to speak to us, and therefore we say, I got a word from God, but you really got a word from Betsy. And Betsy could have been on your Instagram and just wants to be a hero and give you their advice. I'm just saying there could be, now there are bona fide prophets. I'm not, I'm not saying there isn't. I believe in prophecy and I believe in all those things. I'm just saying you've got to be careful because what came out of Betsy's mouth didn't necessarily come out of God's mouth. We need to work from God. We need to work from God. And the primary way that's going to happen is you're going to be reading the word and it's going to be revealed to you. It's going to say something to you. Look at this. Jesus referred to the quickening of the Holy Spirit in John 14, 26 when he said this. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. He's going to speak to you. He's going to teach you. And he will bring to your remembrance whatever I have said. And what has he said? He sent his word. His word performed. He is the word. The Holy Spirit's going to remind you. He's going to speak to you through the word. And it's going to be for a specific purpose and a specific time. It's going to be for the battle that you're in. That rhema word is going to be for the battle that you are in. Right to that situation. Right to that problem. This is not just a wandering, maybe I'm going to hit something and I'm shooting in the dark. No. No. This is a specific situation that you need a word from God for. It's a rhema word. Now remember, where does this house? I'm about the truth. I get a rhema word from the Bible. I get revelation from the Bible. They are inseparable. Quoting someone else's revelation never makes it a sword. Quoting random scriptures for the sake of quoting a scripture never makes it a sword. Revelation from God makes it a sword. There was a fourth century Roman historian. His name was Vagetius. And he said this. He said, a stroke with the edges, though made with ever so much force, seldom kills, as the vital parts of the body are defended by both the bones and armor. On the contrary, a stab, though it penetrates but two inches, is generally fatal. Okay? So, if you think about it, maybe you've seen those movies where they take the sword and they come across somebody. That's a sweeping blow, right? They come across their body. And, and there's all this armor there. There's rib bone there. And, and although it will cut the skin, it's not normally, this one's not normally fatal. But just that much, just, just that much, right up under the armor plate, just a normally fatal. And a rhema word from God is a stab. It's not a sweep. It's not a slice. It's a stab. This is why Paul is using the words that he's using in his language. This sword is a stab. But, but as I examine this sword, I start to think to myself, but why two edges? Why two edges? I mean, I understand the concept that it's going to cut both ways. It's going to cut on both sides. Like, I get that. But I had to do a little bit more homework. I had to do a little bit more homework. You're going to enjoy this one. Hebrews 4.12 tells us this. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged, two-edged sword. Two-edged sword. This word two-edged is the weirdest word in the New Testament. 
It literally is the weirdest word in the New Testament. When, you, when you're looking at it in the Greek, it's the word, bear with me, distomas. 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 It's a compound word. The first word is di, which means two. The second word is stomas, meaning mouth. Wait, a two-mouth sword? So the word of God is quick and alive and powerful and sharper than a two-mouth sword. That makes no sense. It makes no sense unless you understand that Paul is instructing us or the writers of the Bible are instructing us how to use the sword. That it's not just describing what the sword looked like, but it's describing how the sword operates. Follow me. For the word of God to become the sword, it has to come out of two mouths. If the word doesn't come out of two mouths, it's just the belt. It just sits on the belt. But for the, to become a sword, like people want to say all the time, I'm using the sword of the spirit. Are you? How? How are you using it? Because if you're using the sword of the spirit in your interpretation by praying in your head, it then never became a sword. It never became a sword. All right, let's talk about this for a second. Let's talk about it. We're going to get there, all right? The Bible says that when the, Jesus said to his disciples, speak to the mountain, that it be removed and cast into the sea, right? Is that mountain ever going to move if you don't speak it out of your mouth? So why do we all pray in our head? We pray in our head. Listen, let's just be for real. Can we, can, can we be, just be transparent? We pray in our heads because we're lazy. Because we're lazy. We're lazy. We lay in our bed. God knows my heart. Yeah, your heart's lazy. Your heart's lazy. Get your behind up. And if you don't want nobody to hear you because you're insecure, if that's what you're going to say, and I just don't want anybody to hear me, then go in the shower. Turn the shower on and talk to the Lord. Pray out loud. Pray over your kids out loud. Listen, some of y'all need your kids to catch you praying. They're catching you cussing your spouse out. How about we let them catch us praying? Never in Scripture does it say that we're to pray in our head. The sword becomes a sword when it comes out of two mouths. The first mouth is God's. That's the revelation. That's the rhema. That's God speaking the Scripture to you. It came out of God's mouth. But it ain't a sword yet. It gets its first edge as it's coming out of the mouth of God. It gets its second edge when it comes out of your mouth. That's when it's an offensive weapon. Not when it stays stuck in your head. Listen, your Bible verses, your scriptures, your revelation stuck in your head keeps it stuck in the sheath. What are you doing in your head? I'm rebuking the devil. How are you rebuking him if he don't hear you? The devil is not omnipotent. He's not omniscient. He's not all-knowing. The devil doesn't know the future. He doesn't know what you're going to do tomorrow. He doesn't know your thoughts. The devil's not in your head. He don't know none of that. He only knows what's happened, and he only knows what the book says. So you know what? You need to get that word out your mouth. And as you start taking that scripture, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The weapons of my warfare are not carnal, but mighty to God through the tearing down of strongholds. Everything I set my hands to will prosper and be successful. I am blessed in the city. I'm blessed in the field. I'm blessed in the coming and I'm going. I am an overcomer. All these verses that you hear me share every week, those are my revelation. Every, I listen, every single Sunday I pray, everything that you set your hands to will prosper. That's my revelation. 
I pray it. I'm speaking that over you every single week. A lot of Christians walking around fully dressed in armor. Don't know how to use it. Never. You know they say, I think they say 90% of police officers retire never drawing their weapon. Isn't that true? Is that a true statement? Right? It's very high. It's a very high number. That they never had to actually draw it or, or even, let alone fire it. I think there's a lot of Christians, man. They live their entire life and they never... But I, God, will you just fix this for me? I'm hurting so bad, and everything's just so wrong. Can you? Could you imagine if we actually knew this one two years ago? There's no plague or calamity that shall come nigh my dwelling. Looks nice. Feels good. I feel powerful. Huh? Oh, my shoe. Okay. I feel powerful. I feel strong. But I've never actually used it. I shine it. I make it pretty. I wonder what the sword of the Spirit could do in your life if we not only took the time to get a revelation but then use that revelation on that specific situation in our life. It only takes about that much to win the fight. It only takes about that much to win the fight. Just hitting that situation at the right spot, at the right time. Here's the deal. Here's the deal with this. You don't get this until you get him. Because you're not going to get the first word if you don't have right standing with him. You're not going to get the first side of that sword if you're not in a relationship with him. Right? And that's, that, that's, that's, that's the easy step. It is easy, but it takes faith. It takes faith to put yourself in a relationship with God, to have right standing with him. And here's what I want to tell you about right standing with God. Right standing with God is not right behavior before God. It's not. Right standing with God makes you a child of God, makes you a son and a daughter of God. I have three kids. They're not perfect. We, get pro we have problems all the time. But they're my kids. They're my kids. I get my life for my kids. Do I always like my kids? No, I don't always like my kids. But guess what? I get my life for my kids in a second. Even in the moment, I don't like them. I give my life for them. That's right standing. That's right standing. And once you get right standing, then right behaving comes along based upon the relationship, based upon your knowledge and your understanding and the goodness of God. But we got to get the right standing. At right standing, at right relationship, all this armor. We become fully dressed for battle. Then we learn more, and more is revealed, and we grow in our faith. Maybe there's someone here today or watching online, you need to take that first step. You need to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. You need to come into a relationship with God and begin this journey with Him. If you're watching online or you're in the room and you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, so you don't even actually possess the sword yet, We'd love to invite you to pray the prayer of salvation today. It's a step of faith. It's confessing Jesus Christ as Lord in the form of a prayer. And it goes like this if you would join me. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'm going to tie this real quick. For all of you that were worried that I was going to step on it and fall off the platform, 
If you prayed that prayer for the very first time and you're watching online, would you connect with one of our online hosts by filling out the connect card on our website? We'd love to send you our six-day devotional called Starting Point. If you're in the room today and you prayed that prayer for the very first time, would you allow me the honor to celebrate you for two seconds? Would you wave at me and say, Pastor Mike, I prayed that today for the first time. Anybody at all as I look across the room real quick on this snowy Sunday, yeah, man, I see you, yeah, man. Over here, yeah, I see you, go, yeah, 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 I see you. Awesome, praise God. We have that same six-day devotional available to you. Our care team members are in the aisle and our ushers, they both have it. It's a, a quick read, a little bit of a workbook that goes along with what we believe here and how we activate our faith in our everyday lives. Uh, maybe you're didn't raise your hand, you're kind of on the fence, like, I don't know about this guy who would bring a sword to church, it's kind of unacceptable. We have a book available at the Welcome Center called Welcome Home. It's a free gift to you that talks about how to begin the walk with Christ, or just to see if you believe what we believe here at Family Church. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you, and we praise you that your word will never return to you void but it will accomplish exactly what you set it forth to do. Lord, we thank you for lives transformed today, coming into connection with you. We thank you, Lord, that everything we set our hands to will prosper and be successful in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I love you. Thank you for watching today's message. My name is Ashley, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. First, we want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is take a next step on your journey, and we would love to help you do that. You can head on over to familychurchny.com or email us at team at to get started today.